Let's look at a nice method for calculating infinite sums from the Laplace transform. And this comes from an article that I found from 2003 by Lesko and Smith. So before we get into it, let's recall what is the Laplace transform. Well, given a function f, the Laplace transform of f of t is defined to be the integral from 0 to infinity of f of t times e to the minus st dt. So that outputs a function of s. And generally, one learns about the Laplace transform in a differential equations class. And it has the effect of turning a differential equation into an algebraic equation. So the idea is you take a differential equation, apply the Laplace transform, get an algebraic equation, solve that algebraic equation, and then apply the so-called inverse Laplace transform, and then you've solved the differential equation. And I should say that you only get an algebraic equation for maybe the standard examples that you see in a differential equations class, not all differential equations. Okay, so here's a chart of maybe some standard Laplace transforms. And generally when you learn about this in a differential equations class, your first day is deriving this chart. So the Laplace transform of t to the n is n factorial over s to the n plus 1. And this is for values of n that are strictly bigger than negative 1. e to the kt transforms into 1 over s minus k. Sine of omega t transforms to omega over s squared plus omega squared. And cosine of omega t transforms to s over s squared plus omega squared. Okay. So that being said, the main example we're going to work with today is finding a closed form for the sum as n goes from 1 to infinity of r to the n over n plus a times n plus b. So it's this nice combination of a geometric type series, this r to the n term, and then maybe this reciprocal of n squared type series. And I'd like to point out here that we have the absolute, absolute value of r is less than or equal to 1 to ensure convergence. And then a and b are not negative integers. So they're anything except for negative integers. And that's because if they were negative integers, well, then we would have cancellation down here in the denominator at some point, and that would be bad. So our first strategy will be to take this n plus a and n plus b in the denominator and rewrite it using a partial fraction decomposition. So let's maybe do the calculation for that right here. And I'm going to leave off the r to the n as we don't really need it for this part of the calculation. So I'm going to take 1 over n plus a times n plus b. And I'd like to decompose this into, I'll call it capital A over n plus a plus capital B over N plus B. Okay, nice. And then my first step will be to multiply by something that gets rid of all of the denominators. And that'll simply be the denominator of the left-hand side. So let's see, that's going to leave me with A times N plus B plus B times N plus A equals 1. So I've multiplied by n plus a times n plus b, and I've swapped the right and the left hand side of the equation, but that's obviously the same. Okay, so now at this point, we're going to take advantage of the fact that we get cancellation if we plug in certain values of n here. So let's do that. And now I know that up here, n is running through just the positive integers. But that being said, for solving this equation, we can maybe expand that to n being any real number. Okay, so let's see. If we plug in n equals negative a, we'll have a times negative a plus b equals 1. Because notice this second term cancels. And that immediately tells us that a is equal to 1 over, I'll write this as b minus a. And then we can do the same thing to cancel out this a term. So we'll take n and set it equal to negative b. So that'll leave us with b times negative b plus a equals 1, which in turn tells us that b is equal to 1 over a minus b. Okay, nice. 
So now putting that into, well, our original sum will allow us to write this in the following way. Well, we'll have this constant of one over B minus A that I can take out, kind of using the fact that one over A minus B is negative one over B minus A. And then we'll have the sum as N goes from one to infinity, we'll have R to the N times the quantity one over N plus A minus one over N plus B. Okay, so again, that's from this partial fraction decomposition here. But check it out, this one over N plus A and this one over N plus B looks a lot like something that's happening here on the Laplace transform chart for the exponential function. And so we can use that. So here we've got one over B minus A and then this is going to be the sum as n goes from 1 to infinity. We have r to the n. And now this is the Laplace transform of e to the minus a t. And then minus e to the minus b t. Or the Laplace transform is a linear operator. So you can think of those as the Laplace transform of the first minus the Laplace transform of the second. But that being said, we don't really need to do that. Okay, so now let's replace the Laplace transform with its definition and see where we can go from there. So here we have one over B minus A, and then we have this sum as N goes from one to infinity, we have R to the N, and then we'll have the integral from zero up to infinity of, I'll write this as E to the minus N times T, and then e to the minus a t minus e to the minus b t dt. Where here I'm using n as my variable for the Laplace transform, which I guess you know we did up here when we saw this n plus a. So maybe I should have said that earlier, but that's okay. Okay, nice. So now we're gonna exchange the order of summation and integration, which is totally allowed here because everything converges really nicely. In fact, it's something called the dominated convergence theorem. Okay, so let's do that. So that'll leave us with one over B minus A. So we'll have the integral from zero to infinity, and then we'll have an E to the minus A T minus E to the minus B T. You know, that doesn't depend on N, so I can bring that outside. And then in here, I'll have the sum as N goes from one to infinity of, well, let's see. This thing depends on n, this r to the n, and this e to the minus nt also depends on n. So perhaps the best way to write this would be r times e to the minus t all raised to the n power dt. Okay, good. But now I can look at that and see that it's a geometric series. So this is geometric series with our common ratio equal to r times e to the minus t. So there's a standard rule for a summation of a geometric series. You get the first term over one minus the common ratio. So that's exactly what we'll use here. So this will bring us with one over b minus a. We'll have the integral from zero to infinity. We'll have e to the minus a t minus e to the minus b t. And then we'll have the starting term, which is r e to the minus t over one minus r e to the minus t, and then this is all within my t integral. Okay, so I think that's looking good. Now let's bring that up and we'll keep going. So after moving a few things around, this is where we ended up. And now we'd like to perhaps do a change of variables. And the motivation here is that we see an e to the minus t in the denominator, and its derivative is in the numerator, another e to the minus t. Well, that's off by a constant, but that's like kind of good enough. So that motivates the following change of variables. So I'm gonna set x equal to e to the minus t. But notice that that means that dx is equal to minus e to the minus t dt. Okay, but going over here, that means that this e to the minus t dt is simply equal to minus dx. So we'll keep that in mind when we start rewriting things. Also, let's see, e to the minus a t is simply e to the minus t raised to the a power, which is x to the a. So that's good, that'll take care of this 
e to the minus a t term here, and then the e to the minus b t term will be taken care of similarly. Okay, now let's notice when t approaches zero from above, which is occurring right here in the integral, then we have x approaching, let's see, number one, because we get e to the zero. And then as t approaches positive infinity, we see x approaching zero because we've got like e to the minus infinity. So that sorts out the bounds of integration. Okay, so now let's rewrite this a little bit. So we'll have r over b minus a, and then we'll have the integral from one to zero of x to the a minus x to the b over one minus r times x, and then we have minus dx here. So that's everything just as is. That being said, I'm gonna take this minus sign in the dx and I'll get rid of it and I'll exchange the order of integration just to keep it a little bit nicer. So now we've got something like that. And without particular values of a, b, or r, this is probably as simple as it can get. So let's take this nice closed form of our infinite sum in terms of an integral and do a couple of examples. So we just did some work to get the following integral representation of this nice, fairly general looking sum. Now we're gonna look at some examples. So our first example will be a case when r is equal to one, so there's no geometric type series part. And it'll be the sum as n goes from one to infinity of one over two n plus one times three n plus one. So let's start off by factoring a two and a three out of the denominator, so it looks more like this over here. So that'll give us a factor of one over six, and then we'll have the sum as n goes from one to infinity of one over n plus half times n plus third. Okay, but now we can write that in its integral representation, you know, using our big tool here. And that'll give us one over six from this one over six times one over, let's see, one half minus one third. And then the integral from zero up to one of x to the half minus x to the third over, let's see, it'll be x minus one. Okay, good, and I've done a little bit of sign changing there. Notice that I swapped the b minus a and the one minus rx just to make everything work out a little bit nicer so there's no hanging minus signs. And now to move on from here, we wanna do something a little bit sneaky. We don't really wanna separate this out into two different integrals because I think they won't converge, but that being said, we wanna do a slightly different u substitution on each. Okay, so let's maybe just write this over here that we want to think about them being separated. So we'll have what I'll call just the antiderivative of x to the half over x minus one dx, and then the antiderivative of x to the third over x minus one dx. Now for this first one, we'll take x and set it equal to u squared, which means dx is two u du. And let's see, that's gonna transform this into two times the integral of, well, we're gonna have u squared in the numerator and u squared minus one in the denominator. And then likewise, over here, we're gonna take x and set it equal to u cubed. That means dx is equal to three u squared du. So that's gonna end up with three times u cubed over u cubed minus one. Okay, so now let's write that out. So this turns into the integral from zero to one of, let's see, two u squared over u squared minus one minus three u cubed over u cubed minus one du. So we're left with something like that. But now where can we go from here? Well, this term we could maybe think of as two times u squared minus one plus two. You know, we just added zero. And then maybe this term we can in turn think of as three u cubed minus one plus three. So let's see, that'll leave us with the integral from zero to one and now this u squared minus one will cancel this one, leaving us with a two, and then we'll have plus 
2 over u squared minus 1. And then here we'll have minus 3 and then minus 3 over u cubed minus 1 du. And that's maybe where I'm going to stop the calculation because at this point we've kind of gotten away from our point of using the Laplace transform and our formula here to calculate nice infinite sums and let's just write down the answer. And so you can maybe calculate each of these with partial fraction decomposition and you get this nice result of pi over 2 times the square root of 3 plus the natural log of 3 times the square root of 3 over 4 all minus 1. So that's the value of this sum. Okay, so now let's move on to another. For our next example, we'll use kind of an arbitrary r. Last time we had r equals 1. And we'll take a to be 0 and b to be 1 based off of this formula over here. Okay, so let's apply this rule. So this will give us r over b minus a, which is simply 1, and then the integral from 0 to 1 of, well, we've got x to the a minus x to the b. So this will be 1 minus x over 1 minus rx, just using, like I said, this formula over here. And now we're going to do a simplification of this, kind of in the spirit that we did before. So let's maybe bring this r in, and so that'll give me the integral from 0 to 1 of r minus rx over 1 minus rx. Notice the numerator kind of like almost cancels the denominator. In fact, we can make it so that we do have cancelable stuff by taking this r and writing it as r minus 1 plus 1. So let's do that. So we have r minus 1 plus 1 minus rx, and then each of those is over 1 minus rx. Great. So that's what I did there. But look at this. This second term is simply equal to the number 1 because we get simplification, and we end up with the integral from 0 to 1 of r minus 1 over 1 minus rx plus 1 dx. But luckily we can find the antiderivative of each of those fairly easily. So notice the antiderivative of the first bit will be the natural log of 1 minus r times x. Well we've got this r minus 1 here and then we've also got to divide by minus r. That's just by the chain rule. So I'm going to use the minus sign to swap this order. So we have 1 minus r over r. So we've got something like that. And then we've got this plus x evaluated from 0 to 1. So now doing this, we'll get 1 and then plus 1 minus r over r times the natural log of 1 minus r. So that's what we get plugging in 1. But notice plugging in 0, we get 0. That's because the natural log of 1 is 0. So there we did it. We found a closed form for this sum. Okay, so have you seen this trick before? And what do you think of it? And if you'd like to practice it, well, I think you could essentially take any calculus textbook that talks about convergence of series. And instead of just determining if the series given converge, well, a lot of them could actually be summed up using this formula which is a lot more satisfying than just determining if it converges. So if you're still around and you haven't subscribed, maybe consider subscribing. It really helps us out, and that's a good place to stop. Thanks for watching and sticking around until the end of the video. And since you're here, don't forget to gently press that like button. Subscribe, ring the bell, and select all notifications to never miss a video. If you want to get your name in the credits like you see here, access the live seminar series, review videos before release, and more, go to patreon.com slash michaelpinmath and become a Patreon member today. If you want full ad-free course content, subscribe to my second channel, Math Major. I've got courses on linear algebra, complex analysis, and proof writing, among several others. And that's everything. Bye.